All right. Welcome to a very special crossover edition uh, with the Night Report and Scarlet Faithful and Night Watch all getting together for our season previews. It's going to be a three-part special. So this first part is going to be a look back to last year and the offensive preview. Second part is going to be defense and special teams preview. And the third part is going to be a schedule prediction where we all give our predictions on how every game of the season is going to go. Uh, but first, I kind of want to go around the room. I'm sure most of you listening will probably know who most of us are already. But in case you don't, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Mike Broadbent. I'm the host of the Night Report podcast and a contributor to the Night Report on Rivals.com. Uh, David Anderson is next to me. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is David Anderson. I'm a frequent guest on Aaron's podcast, The Scarlet Spotlight, and I'm the main Rutgers contributor to <laughs> Off Tackle Empire at the moment. Yes, and uh, that's a good cue. It's actually the Scarlet Faithful, but I'm glad we got a, a, a lap in early. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you might have to edit that. It's fair, it's fair to tribute uh, John Newman and Danny Breslar, but uh, the Scarlet Faithful, David wrote for me at On the Banks, where I was uh, editor-in-chief for many years. I've had the Scarlet Faithful podcast for two years now, I've covered Rutgers sports for nine years. I've been a fan for multiple decades based on the color of my beard and uh glad we've been talking about this for a while and happy that we're able to do this so if uh, you're a long time listener to scarlet faithful thanks for listening once again and uh to those ktr and night watch listeners uh appreciate the opportunity to to be in front of you and larry k with night watch i was a writer for aaron as well and for on the banks for a while long time poster on the on the forum there with the night report long time listener to both you guys write a little bit for a, a site called the college huddle right now appear on Aaron's show got my first uh, appearance on tkr recently uh, and night watch the name's there that's my channel happy to be here guys really appreciate it Did i introducing myself yeah you're introducing uh, okay all right now my name is richie <laughs> o'leary uh i'm the publisher of the night report uh, i've been covering Rutgers for approaching the 10 year mark now um done everything from recruiting coverage to team coverage and now uh, entering the podcast sphere. So uh, yeah, it's been fun. All right, well, now that we've table set and everyone knows everyone's name, I'm gonna do a quick ad read and then we'll get into the bulk of the show. Uh, this podcast is presented to you in part by Night and Day Apparel. Get ready for football and tailgating season with Night and Day Apparel. Uh, our apparel is designed to keep you comfortable and stylish from the pregame excitement to the final whistle. Whether you're grilling in the parking lot or cheering from the stands, our high quality gear has you covered with unbeatable comfort and team spirit. Use our promo code Rutgers Rivals to get 10% off your purchase. Score big this season and keep chopping with night and day apparel. Um, let's talk a little bit about last season first. We'll kind of cover everything. Um, Aaron, I'll have you start. How do you feel the team did overall? Do you think they overachieved last year right around where they should have been? Or do you think they underachieved given everything you know in hindsight as well? I think what Rutgers did last year was exactly what the ceiling was for that team. I think based on uh, the experience they had back, uh, the question mark they had at quarterback, the issues they went through uh, in terms of, you know, they, they won all the games on paper. I think you expected them to win. Uh, that Michigan State game was a game that, you know, they very easily could have lost. Uh, and they lost all the games that you pretty much before the season expected them to. So I think their performance in the bowl game really kind of helped set expectations for this season. Uh, because they played so well and beat a solid Miami team. Obviously, both seasons a little bit different with players leaving early and all that, not the entire roster playing. But I think that's really where expectations for this season began. Uh, but overall, I think as a Rutgers fan, year four for Shiano, you had to be happy with last season. Uh, and I think that that's a big reason why people expect more this year uh, based on so many players coming back. All right. How about you, Larry? How do you feel last season went? Uh, right. You know, game for game. I had him at six for six and I had the predictions, wins and losses on on target. The Miami game, uh, when we got that scheduled, I predicted a win for that one kind of in the way we did it. I think it's interesting and there's a little bit of duality. And, and Mike, I think you might be able to chime in here because I remember your prediction early and then you said, look, you got to adjust expectations based on what we've seen now. And, sure. and at the end of the day, I think it was right where they, they should have been. I do think when you look back at the season and what we saw in the field, both sides of the ball, 
had some issues at the quarterback position, you know, and you had some bad breaks. You also had some good breaks like Michigan State. So it's where we should be, but I think, you know, you tweak it one way or the other, they could have achieved a little bit more, which maybe then it would have been overachieving. I think they they hit their their ceiling and and we're right where they they should have been. Uh, but like Aaron said, I think it sets us up for higher expectations this year because I think they might have exceeded some expectations last year. And even where I had them could have even been better if, if some things were corrected. So be you rich. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's no secret. I had them at four wins last season as a prediction and a lot of things fell their way. And who knew Kyle Monongai was going to be a thousand yard rusher before the season. I don't think yeah. anyone said that. Um, I think they got Northwestern and Virginia tech at the right time because those teams both heavily improved over the year or over the season, I should say. Um, and they were struggling at quarterback play. There's no secret about it. It was the most inaccurate quarterback two years in a row. And if you have that, you're not going to be able to really pass the ball. And the fact that they were still able to run the ball somehow is just super impressive. Um, a lot of bounces just uh, fell their way. Like you guys said, it was, it was basically the ceiling of what they could have done. And, I also included that part in my uh, four four win prediction. I said the ceiling <laughs> six wins, so don't don't hate me too much. Yeah, I, so if you would have told me before last season they're going to go seven and six with a win over a former Big East rival, if you want to call it that, uh, I think anybody would have taken it. But seeing how the season played out, like Larry was kind of alluding to, yesterday's price was not today's price in terms of if you're looking at mid season. We're six and two. You know, we're getting a bye week going into Ohio State. Like I, that the buzz in that stadium, like we were, we could have won that game. I'll go to my grave saying that that was a game that was very much winnable. You know, we're winning by, you know, seven points or 10 points or something like that in the second half. Um, so overall, I'm happy with how last season went, but I do feel like it, we left, like Shiano said, a lot of yards on the field, a lot of points on the field with how the, uh, the actual offense ended up getting played out. How about you, David? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway, uh, you know, like Richie mentioned, none of us had Kyle Manungai for a thousand yard rusher. But when you look at basically position group by position group, nobody else really drastically exceeded our expectations. I mean, maybe Holland Pierce at left tackle, if you were a little bit bearish on him, maybe Flip Dixon in the secondary, maybe Mo Touré was healthier than you thought he was going to be last year. Um, but nobody else really took an insane jump, which is why I feel pretty confident that the team's roughly where they should have been, as well as having a foundation to continue to build upon in this season. Yep. And let's kind of talk about some of the, the personnel changes on offense before we get into any sort of predictions. So if I'm counting this correctly, Rutgers has seven starters returning on offense. We have Christian Dremel, Alan Pierce, Ryan Felter, Gus Salinskis, Tyler Needham, and Kyle Manungai returning as starters. And then the new starters will probably be Daimir Miller, one of the receivers. I don't want to say who is or he's not going to start. Uh, Kobe Asamoah at right guard, Kenny Fletcher at tight end, and Ethan Kaliak Manis at quarterback. Um, in terms of this, this collection on offense, who do you think would be the kind of the guy you would point to as like the X factor heading into the season? outside of quarterback on the entire offense in terms of new players on the roster, Larry? Uh, outside of quarterback, I have to go. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Dimir Miller is going to, you know, turn a lot of heads. I think he adds an element to the offense we haven't seen. And that's not to take away from – we've had playmakers and we had them last year. And, you know, the quarterback factor plays into to what they could do. But I think he's going to add a, a wrinkle in playmaking ability and consistency – um, in, in electric play and big play ability coupled with that quarterback addition that, that is going to turn a lot of people's heads. And I think you're going to be hearing that name early and often, and uh, it's going to be a big impact for us this year. How about you, Rich? Uh, you know, I, I wanted to say Dimir Miller, but I'm going to have to go with uh, Chris Long. This is a guy that's been around the program for a long time now. Uh, he's moved between defensive back and wide receiver. Um, he's finally healthy, it seems like. And he just had bad break after bad break. This was arguably wide receiver one going into last season. And then what was it? 10 plays in, 15 plays in. He gets injured and he's done for the year. Uh, it happened to him a couple of times over his career at Rutgers, five-year career at Rutgers. Um, and then if you look back to some of the games, I shouldn't say some of the games, he only had one season where he really had a little bit of production, but it was 15 receptions for 200 yards and a touchdown. 
if you can kind of replicate that and stay healthy all year long, I, I think ironically long, long, there, there you see that, see that little joke <laughs> I made there. Um, but uh, as long as, as long as he can stay healthy, I think he could be that X factor. I'm going to go with Kenny Fletcher just because he's got the athletics chops that we haven't really seen at the tight end position in a long time. I mean, just that one 30 yard uh, catch he had in the spring game kind of made you realize, Oh, not only do we have a guy who can get open as at tight end and catch the ball at tight end, we have a quarterback who's not afraid to throw the type of route that he ran. I think it was just like an out route um, that he was able to get open on a linebacker and just kind of basically catch the ball in, in stride and fall down. And uh, we haven't had a guy who could really do that in a while. How about you, David? I mean, all good selections. I'm going to have to go with whoever running back uh, two would be. And I don't just mean it's not Sam Brown. What I mean is whoever is that change of pace back, if it's Brown, if it's Benjamin, if it's one of the freshmen, because I think we all know that they can't afford to give Manungai the amount of carries that he got last year. Obviously, you know, we didn't think he was broken down late in the year, but when you saw him in that bowl game, he definitely was bringing, bringing it. And uh, whoever can just offer another wrinkle to offload carries from him, perhaps even at the goal line, and make opposing defensive coordinators have to prepare for something other than the the, the run with Manungai and or, you know, just this, between the tackles running, I think that's going to be the biggest X factor for the offense outside of quarterback. How about you, Aaron? All good answers. Uh, I'm going to go with Ian Strong. I think in terms of his playmaking ability, uh, we saw flashes of it last year, and I think he could be uh, – if he can become a true red zone target for them in the past game, I think that he can bring in a whole other element to this offense. Obviously, Demir Miller is getting a ton of hype, uh, but I think that if Strong can make that leap from year one to year two, like we all hope that he can, I think it will bring a different dynamic to this past game that they haven't had in a while. Love all those answers. All of them were things that kicked around in my head, so it just kind of goes to show how much uh, – promise we have across the roster that we're all just not thinking of the same guy. And I'm, I'm sure some of these guys were your 1A, but we have a, a close 1B to go to. Um, if there was a single position group where depth concerned you most outside of quarterback, Rich, where would you say that position group lies on offense? I think I speak for probably just about everyone here when I say cornerback. Um, after longer being, on offense, on offense. Oh, on sorry. offense. See, yeah, look at that. I'm already messing up. Um, <laughs> going offense, it's probably the not one position specifically, but that right side of the offensive line really concerns me. They brought in a transfer in Shedrick Rhodes Jr., who I thought was probably going to be the starter, and that because you don't really bring in a transfer in, at any position, let alone uh, offensive line, and not have them start game one. Um, so that's where it's a really big question mark that right side. I know Kobe Asamoah has been pretty good at right guard. Um, he's been rotating in a little bit, but they, is he the answer there? I still think he's a little small for the guard spot, but it's that really that right side of the line scares the the hell out of me. I don't know yeah, if I, can I mean, on this. Uh, you, uh, I can curse on ours. Sorry. Um, so yeah, Kobe Asamoah and, and Reggie Sutton were our two lowest graded uh, offensive linemen on PFF last year. So I I I think that's my choice as well. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of right guard and right tackle because it doesn't seem like somebody has really grasped either of those by the horns in camp. So I just hope that, you know, Flats has the ability to kind of cobble something that makes sense together like he did last year. How about you, David? I'll kind of stay in the same vein, but I'll actually go with the other side because I think on the right side of the line, you have a lot of guys who not only expect to play, but the staff expects that they'll be in the rotation. But on the left side, I mean, your key in your statement was depth. And so what yep. that means to me is, you know, if there's more film on Felter, if Pierce, you know, has to miss even just a critical drive in a key game, like, do they have someone behind him who can step in? I just think that the drop off potentially on the left side of the line is bigger than the right side and the staff is prepared for the right side. So that's why, to me, the left side concerns me. But if you ask me that question any year, probably for the last decade, I probably would have said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Aaron? Uh, I'm going to give Larry a layup here because I'm going to focus on who I was going to answer before as well. Uh, Kenny Fletcher, I think tight end is a huge question mark. Yeah. Uh, and I think that people might be undervaluing the loss of Johnny Langan uh, in terms of a blocker uh, in the run game. I think uh, obviously he had his, uh, he, he made his contributions in the past game, but his real value was as a blocker on that line. And I think A, can Kenny Fletcher 
uh, be comparable to what he brought uh, in the in the run game? And if you can't, uh, what do they have behind them? Is it Victor Kanapka? Is it Mike Higgins? Is it some of the younger guys? Uh, because if Rutgers doesn't have that same uh, impact in the in the blocking run game uh, at tight ends, I do think that it's you know that helped a lot with the offensive line last year. So I think that that's a huge key uh, going into this season. Yeah, I would include that that right side of the line, but also that Fletcher, you know, uh, conundrum that that Aaron brought up. If he has that athleticism while blocking as well, and and kind of adds an asset to that line that could help if he stays in line. I mean, we don't know yet if we're going to have a huge tight end passing game under this regime. It could be more of a blocking type person, even though he's flashed athleticism in the passing game, which could add an extra wrinkle. Uh, that line may need help on the right side. That being said. You know, we we don't rush for a thousand yards without coming through in a position that we thought could be a potential weakness last year. So I'm excited to kind of see what this rotation does on the right side, what the staff could come up with and uh, what happens with it. But clearly, if you're looking at that offensive side of the ball with all the playmakers we have with the quarterback, what we think is an upgrade, that's got to be the, the area of concern there. Before we get into our categories where we kind of go through each one and say whether we think something uh, like who, who leads the team in catches, who leads the team in receiving yards, et cetera. Just raise your hand in here. If you think there's a storyline that is underrated, that isn't getting talked about enough, that could be a huge impact on this offense this year. If you don't have one, I don't want you to force it. So that's why I'm just asking to raise your hand. Aaron, I see you. What do you think is an underrated storyline that isn't getting talked about enough? Well, we just all did not talk about it. And that <laughs> if, if, if Ethan Kelly McManus goes down, I, I think True. Rutgers is in real, you know, it's not to say that a Johnny Shepard can't step up, but he's completely unproven. And obviously with AJ Serace being limited in camp, you know, that's, a, that's a major concern. So I think that will be very interesting, especially early on in these first two games. I think it will go into how they call the game. Uh, I think they're going to be ultra conservative uh, because I think they have to keep him upright. And that again, goes back to the offensive line. But if Cali Manis goes down, I think all bets are off in terms of what this season could actually be. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I'm super bullish on uh, a certain bet about this team that we'll get into more in the schedule prediction, but that will go way out the window if I think Cali Manis misses even, even a couple of these toss-up games, which I feel like the schedule is riddled with. Again, we'll get into that later, but totally agree there, Aaron. Uh, anybody else have a storyline that they want to just kind of talk about that they feel is getting uh, underserved in the Rutgers community right now? No. Mm. All right, let's get into these predictions then. We're going to start off with who we think is going to be the leading receiver on the team in catches. And I set the over-under for this at 49 and a half. Um, don't ask me why, I just felt right. Uh, I'm going to go with Chris Long here. I think he's a guy that in his career has shown a real ability to get open and I think Ethan will be better at just dinking and dunking down the field to guys who just are able to get some separation. So if he stays healthy, I think he leads the team in catches, but I don't think he hits the 49 and a half number. I'm going to hit say under for the catches, but Chris Long is my leader. How about you, David? What's your prediction? Who do you think leads the team in catches? And also is it over or under 49 and a half? I'll take the safe answer. I'll take Christian Dremel and I'll take the under. Because I do think that he's going to be relied upon less. There's entirely possible scenarios where Long, like you mentioned, or even Miller get reps in the slot to offload some of that. But I do think at the end of the day, he's your most reliable target. I think Kelly Manis is much better at throwing inside the numbers than previous Rutgers quarterbacks. He's maybe not as good outside the numbers. And so I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for Dremel, even if he doesn't play every snap like he basically did last year. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, I'm actually going to say the same thing, but uh, also say I think because Rutgers does have more playmakers uh, down the field uh, with, I think, strong improves, uh, Demir Miller, uh, if Long is healthy, I think that will open things up more for Dremel in the slot. And I think uh, in terms of that rapport with Cali Manis being a safety valve there, uh, I think I think he falls the under in terms of 49.5 receptions, but... I do think also uh, that he will lead the team in receptions simply because if he, the fact that he led the team in receptions last year and there was real no deep threat, uh, if they can have any semblance of a, of a deep passing threat this year, I think that only helps him uh, in terms of, of his uh, ability. 
as much as Would I'd like, like to inject some flair in here and, and do something <laughs> different, I got to just be boring and say Christian Dremel. I thought that was going to be an interesting answer. I guess not. I think look, <laughs> he, he led the, the team last year when we, we didn't have much of a, of a consistent passing game. I think this year you got an, a reliable player who's an upperclassman, who's shown the ability to kind of be that uh, safety valve, get open type of guy, make tough catches type of guy, that Wayne Corbett, so to speak. I think even if you've got guys on the outside, guys downfield making plays, uh, if we're throwing more, we're going to just have, you know, more to go around in general. I still think Dremel gets his piece. I still think he's the the comfort, you know, safety valve in the, on the field there. I took the under because, again, he might not be on the field uh, all the time for every snap. And I just think there's so many options knowing this staff, knowing what we saw with some of these guys, they're going to rotate these guys. And if they're rotating these guys, I, it's going to be hard for anybody to, to, to break that 50 catch threshold because I still think we're going to rely a lot on the running game. So I did go the under, but I do think Dremel's going to have a repeat. I mean, they don't even have to throw more. They just have to complete more passes. And I think with Ethan, <laughs> you do that automatically. Like, I, I'm, I'm a big hater of Gavin Wimson. I'll just say it. Um, he's, he's just not a good quarterback. But if you just get a more accurate quarterback, you're going to have a lot more receptions. Now, that being said, I'm, I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to go Dimir Miller. I think Miller's going to see a lot more time in the slot than people think. And I think he's going to be like that safety valve that Dave was kind of talking about. I know he's mentioned Dremel, but I think if Miller plays right. a lot, as much slot as I'm thinking, I think he'll be that safety valve and he's got the speed in that slot that he can just get the ball, get in the space and take off. And that's pretty much it. As for the 49 and a half, no one's done that since Bo Melton in 2021 where he had 55. I, I'm probably going to stay under just because like you guys all mentioned, they're going to rotate receivers. There's going to be a ton of guys getting reps and snaps. Um, Greg keeps mentioning a bunch of young guys from Benjamin Black to KJ Duff to uh, I don't even know who else. Nassim Brantley, we don't even talk about who's probably going to get some snaps right. as well. So I'm going to have to go under on that, but uh, I'm going to go Dimir Miller. Yeah, there's there's a lot of options, and I, I just think it just speaks is a testament to the depth of the uh, the receiver room in general that we have so many guys that we can point to and just be like, I can see that, I can see that, I can see that. Um, let's talk about yardage though. Uh, I set the over under for yardage here. Maybe this might be too high too, but uh, I set the over under for yardage at 749 and a half. Uh, David, what do you think the leading receiver is going to be? And where do you sit him uh, in terms of over under that number? I probably feel as confident in this answer as any that I've given. And I have no inside information like you guys have, but I really do think Demir Miller is going to lead the team in yards because whatever they decide to do with him, it's going to result in yardage. If he's better in the slot, he'll play the slot. If he's better on the outside, he'll play the outside. If he's on the outside, you figure he'll get a couple more, he'll get a few more yards, even if it's a few less catches. So I do think that that's probably the cheap answer there, but I just, he does, I think some things that no one else on the team does yet. And so I'm going to go with him, but I'm going to take the under because of like all we said, I, if he is that good, defenses are just going to roll a cover two at him and it's going to be really hard for him to, like 50 or 60 yard catches to pad those stats. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go under as well. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to go with Miller simply because I think his versatility, I think the fact that they can line him up in multiple ways. I, I do think it's fair to wonder and question, you know, jumping up from the FCS level. Uh, he's a four year FCS guy. So to now go to the Big Ten, that's certainly going to be an adjustment. But it does seem uh, as uh, Koi Ashano plays, as much as he talks about Demir Miller, uh, you have to believe that he's a huge part of their plans and is their overall best playmaker in the past game. So you would uh, have to think going into the season, he's going to be number one in terms of the game plan. Uh, I agree with David that he's also going to be number one in terms of the defense is trying to take him out of it. Uh, but I think just because of his versatility and ability to do different things within the pass game, uh, that's going to allow him to uh, be the leading receiver. But I think he'll be, uh, you know, well under that that over under of 750. I, I'm going to have to start changing my answer just to add some argument <laughs> to the panel here. But it, Miller, man, Miller, I, I I think I echo all the all the sentiments that that Dave and Aaron Aaron put forth. Uh, I wanted desperately to go over, and I know he, I think he was well with over a thousand last year, but it's a different. Different team, different league, different. I just think when when you're looking at this, it's we keep reiterating it, but 
there's so much wealth to go around with the amount of playmakers we have. Defenses are going to hone in on one guy, and we're going to have to spread the ball to other guys. Uh, and again, that running game is still going to be prominent. So I went with the under as far as yardage, but I think Miller's going to be the leading yardage receiver. It's a tough one. I, like, I want to say Chris Long because I said it is going to be a breakout player, but I'm probably going to have to go Miller. I think Chris Long will be close. Um, but looking back, like no, this hasn't happened for Rutgers offense since 2015 when Leontay Carew had 39 for 809, which by the way, looking back at that, holy hell, a crazy stat line for Rutgers offense, mind you. But, um, yeah, no, I just, I'm, I'm going to say it's going to be Dimir Miller. I'm going to go under, um, and they're going to rotate a bunch of different guys at all these wide receiver positions. You're going to see all kinds of new names that most of you haven't probably even heard of ever. So it's going to be an interesting unit this year, and I think it'll be a better pass game, but I still don't think you'll have a, like a 750 to 800 yard receiver either. Uh, I'm going to be boring. and I'm also picking Dimir Miller, but I'm going to spice it up. I'm going to say he's going to go over. So I think it's the clear answer for a lot of reasons that you guys have all really well articulated. Uh, if you were to hit, and these are all regular season numbers too, we're not including the bowl. And if there's a hypothetical uh, CFP run or whatever, uh, we're only doing the first 12 games of the season. You need to average 63 yards a game to get to 750. I don't think he's going to be anywhere close to consistent to hit that number, but I could see Dimey Miller easily having like 150 yard, two touchdown game mixed into a 25 yard game where he only gets two catches. So I think he's going to be the big play threat that those big plays are going to be what pushes him over that threshold, but it's not going to be that he's consistently getting between 60 and 80 yards. Cause I don't think that's going to be the case. Um, the next stat we have is going to be the leading receiver in touchdowns. I have set the line at five and a half. Aaron, let's go to you. Who do you think is going to lead the team in receiving yard touchdowns? And is it going to be over or under that five and a half number? Yeah, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to stick to what I said before. I think Ian Strong, his ability to be a, a playmaker, a difference maker in the red zone. I think that's one underrated thing about last season is you knew once they got into the red zone, they really didn't have the ability to throw the ball. Uh, and I think that that will be different this year. I think it's something they prioritized. I think with Cali Manis, uh, you know, he has the ability to, to make those throws. And I think that Strong is going to be that number one target in the red zone. So I'm going with Ian Strong and the over. I kind of um, went back and forth on this in terms of how am I looking at this, right? Am I looking at red zone threat? Are a lot of these touchdowns going to come from short yarded situations in the goal line? Or are these touchdowns going to come from further out in big play ability? And I, I decided to go with big play. And, and therefore, I, I selected Damir Miller uh, as leading receiver for touchdowns. I think I also thought about some of the front loaded, you know, two games. And sometimes we see guys just go off in those games and it's a lot of fun. You grab, I went over on the touchdowns because you get a couple touchdowns within those first two games and all of a sudden you're home free as far as trying to get six touchdowns. I think I agree with the fact, Mike, what you said in terms of yardage, where you're going to have games where he's quiet, where they shut him down, where our game plan goes away from him. But then you're going to have games where you get two bombs and all of a sudden, you know, you have two more touchdowns. I think seeing Cali Manis, the little bit we saw in the spring game and what we've heard is it seems like he can throw the deep ball. He can throw it with some accuracy. Now you get behind a defense. We've seen guys do it. Dimir Miller can do it if we've seen some of these other guys do it. There's going to be more players than him getting these big plays, but he can get big plays. And if he can get big plays throughout the course of a season, you can get over uh, five and a half touchdowns. So that's my my bet there. Ooh, it's a tough one. I think the leading touchdown receiver, and I'm going to get a little spicy with this one. I'm going to go Nassim Brantley. Mm -hmm. He's a little bit, he's taller than most of these receivers they have in this group. It's usually a six foot, uh, 5'11", or 5'9", if you talk to Christian Dremel. Um, so you need that tall red zone threat, and he kind of provides that. He's got the wingspan. He's got the production sort of at a different level. I know it's been a couple years since he's played because the stupid NCAA thing and then the injury. Um, but I, I think there's a good shot. He could be a, a – a, at least a touchdown stealer of sorts for this wide receiver room. I don't think he'll get crazy yardage. I don't get a, a crazy amount of receptions, but I do think he could snag a, a good amount of touchdowns. Now, if he gets five and a half, that's where it's close. I think he's going to probably hover around that five number and it potentially could go over, but I'm going to say under for now. I'm going to go over. I'm going to go with uh, Ian Strong for the same reason a lot of you guys have already said. I just think he's that big bodied target. And I think most of his touchdowns are going to come from within the red zone. Um, and I'm going to go with the over five and a half as well. Um, David, how about you? Where do you, where do you, uh, stand on this? 
yeah, I would say the betting favorite, probably stronger Miller. I guess the way I'm looking at it is I think there's going to be more touchdowns in, especially in short yardage, you know, second and goal from the three yard line type of thing where, but what I, what I'm not sure of though, and you guys obviously have the inside information more than me, but I'm not sure if that's going to be in strong for the reasons you mentioned, because if he's, if he is having to play or is wanted to play in more downs in the middle of the field, I just, I, I see how Shiano likes to rotate that like short yardage package, which normally has three or four tight ends. And I do think that, like the old, what you would play in Madden, like the Miami look where they put a wide receiver as one of those three like tight end spots. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's strong. Maybe it's Duff. Maybe it's, you know, somebody else like Brantley. I just think it's whoever's in that role, which the role that strong was in last year, which mm-hmm. may or may not be him. So I guess the cheap answer would be to say him, but it's entirely possible. Someone else draws that assignment when we're going like we're going heavy and like it's a hockey style mm-hmm. line change and somebody else is that third tight end that's getting those play action wide open tosses. But I guess yeah, I have to a... say Ian Strunk and because he's the default in that spot that he held down last year. Sure. Until we get more information, that's kind of the, the best bet for sure. Um, the next stat I have, it's all Kyle Minungai related, the next three. So this next stat is just over or under uh, 999 yards on the season. So basically, does he hit a thousand yards rushing again this season? Larry, I'm going to give it to you first. Where do you think he stands on this? I think he's going to be an awesome player. I think he's going to carry the load. I think he's going to be, you know, the, the guy we all love and we're going to cheer for. I, I think he's not going to hit 1,000 this year. And that's no uh, rough take on him. I just think the way the offense is going to be set up here, you're going to want to preserve him a bit. You got other options at running back that could take maybe more snaps and more crucial positions than last year if they've taken a step forward. And then you've got this passing game that I think is going to mix things up where you're not necessarily having to consistently just feed the ball to him. Make no mistake. There's going to be games. This is a coach Chiano team where they're going to just feed him and that's going to be the philosophy, you know, and they're just going to keep feeding and feeding and feeding. If it's working towards the end of the games, they're going to do that. Um, But I think you're going to just, just by the sheer fact that I think you're going to see more hands on the ball and the fact he cleared it last year, but it wasn't like, you know, 1,500 or something. I think it comes down just a little bit. Um, and I, I don't remember. It, Mike, you might know the stats. I thought it was like he just barely cleared it in the regular season and then got up to like 12 after mm-hmm. the whole game. Yeah, he got to 1,099 yards in the regular season. And that was on the back of a 118-yard rushing game against Maryland that were mostly empty calories. Um, and then he had that 160-yard game in the bowl. So he, it, it looks pretty gaudy, but like you said, he, he barely cleared it in the regular season last year, and, and the, the bowl game helped make his stats buoyed a lot. But obviously we're not counting those for these stats because uh, it's just regular season. Rich, how about you? Right. I, I think he goes over. Um, retooled, and I shouldn't say retooled, mostly the same mm-hmm. offensive line for the most part. I think they're going to get better under Pat Flaherty again. Um, they're going to take that next step, that whole unit as a whole. Um, I also think the fact that they're going to have an increased pass game is going to open up some more things in the run game. You got to mind you, he was doing this with a not so great <laughs> pass game last year. I know I keep harping on it. I know I keep saying it wasn't good, but it's just the numbers just say it was awful. Um, so you increase that and get a little bit of the pass game going. It's going to open up a ton for Kyle Manangai. Um, and the guy just likes to bounce off people too. So it makes it that much easier, um, to get that thousand yards. But on top of that, it's an easier schedule. Like we, I don't, I know we haven't really mentioned it on this pod, but we've mentioned it multiple episodes before. Um, there's no Michigan, there's no Ohio state, there's no Penn state, there's no Oregon. Like you can, the list goes on and on. This schedule is a lot easier than it was last year. And I think because of that, because of the increased pass game, he should be able to hit the thousand yard mark, if not eclipse it by a, a good chunk. I'm also going to go with the under here just because I do think that Sam Brown, he really showed some incredible flashes as a freshman. And, you know, he, you know, the flash went out as quickly as it seemed to spark up uh, with the injury. And last year, you know, the injury he was recovering from is not something that's easy to recover from. Uh, I heard it was a Liz Frank injury. So those typically are like a two year thing to get back to feeling 100%. And I really think that a lot of the the early schedule, you don't want to just grind him into the ground for no reason. I think he's going to be a big time money down guy, like in situations where like Shiano's kind of alluded to it. The game is going to dictate his usage, where if we need him late in games, especially he's going to use him. But if not, he's not going to waste carries 
that could be better used elsewhere. So I do think he's going to put up some gaudy stats, but I don't think it's necessarily going to be in the rushing yard category. So I'm going to say he was under in the regular season uh, of a thousand yards. How about you, David? I'm going to take the over because I think one of the things that we often forget is that all these guys that have potential, they haven't actually done it at the college level. Kyle Manungai has done it. That's number one. Number two, like Richie was mentioning about the defenses, there's no Iowa who's basically going to just sell out and dare you to throw. So, I mean, there's less, there's not going to be that on the schedule. But most importantly, I think that he's the heart and soul of this team. And I know Coach Shiano would never say that milestones matter ever. But I do think that there is something to be said for players in the locker room uh, knowing that he's toting the rock. And I think that it's it's more important to the heartbeat of the team that he's getting carries sometimes, even if someone else could make the same carry for the same number of yards. So I'm going to take the over. I mean, Ray Rice ran for 2,000. And, and so, I mean, he's only got to do half that. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm going over too. Uh, and I think because, first of all, I think his yards per carry is going to go up. It was 5.2 last year to some of the points that Richie and David made. I think that you'll see that yards per carry go up. But I also think, similarly to David, but a little bit different, I think as much as he is that identity, and that's very true, I also think that Shiano is so rooted in wh what he wants to do to win games. He even talked about it in his press conference on Monday about special teams in the return game and how conservative that he, he, I was actually surprised how he said, we're going to be really selective in the return game. Uh, we only, you know, we led the country last year on five returns. So he, he's, he's not going to deviate from his formula. <laughs> and I think his one a card in the winning formula is giving the ball to Kyle Manungai when the game is on the line. And I think that to all the reasons we talked about being fresher down the stretch, if Brown can, deliver whoever that second running back is, if they can have things open up a little bit in the past game, I think you're going to see a, a true formula down the stretch of just handing it to Manungai. And I think he can do even better than he did last year in terms of his closing out game ability. Now, and the next stat I want to talk about is one that Kyle Manungai hasn't necessarily been utilized a ton in the passing game, but I set his over under for receptions this year at 14 and a half. Richie, do you think he goes over or under that number? I'm going to say under. Um, I think when it comes to passing situations, you'll probably see other guys come in, whether it be Sam Brown, um, Ja'Shawn Benjamin, Antoine Raymond's going to play a role at some point too. Uh, I think all those other guys, are whenever he needs a break, for, so to speak, or Mananga needs a break, they're going to sub him in, and then it's probably going to be either a blocking situation or a passing situation. And I just I can't see him getting many receptions overall. It's, what do you have last year, like eight, if that? He had six in the regular season, six. eight total. Yep. Yeah, so I just can't see it changing really that much. Kirk Schrock is a very simple man with a simple plan, like you guys said before. Chiano doesn't change his ways. He's stuck in a little bit stuck in his ways at times, but uh, I think it's going to be, for the most part, a similar offense, just uh, a little bit different when it comes to um, who's going to be in the backfield when they're going on passing situations. I've got the over here for two main reasons. One, I know David has harped on this a lot on the Scarlet Faithful about just how – Ethan Kaliak Manis is like going to take the open receiver in the open uh, situation basically every time, even includes dump down, dump offs. And so he's very comfortable doing that. And they also probably want to boost Kyle Manungai's draft stock as much as they can too, because right now he's just only shown he can be like a bruising kind of uh, runner. And the modern NFL is all about the pass game. So I think they want to showcase him a bit there. Um, so I do think he goes over that. Uh, I think he gets between 15 and 20 receptions on the year. He's not going to be a guy who catches four or five passes a game, but I do think he goes over that comfortably. How about you, David? Yeah, I mean, I guess I should agree with you since you credited <laughs> me for your comment. Uh, my my main reason for going over, and this is kind of a theme we'll probably talk about more with the defense, but Shano often talks about what's best for the team versus what's best for the player. And so an argument can be made that it's best for the player, in this case, Manungai, to receive more receptions because it boosts his draft stock. But there's also an argument to be made that that's better for the team because it means that defenses are going to have to respect it more. I mean, I, I figure you got if he has one primarily targeted reception a game, he's going to get one other just dump off, check down, play action where they just leave him, something like that. So I, I think he's going to over, even if it's not, Shiano's going to say because of his draft stock. I mean, we saw Braylon Allen was not a good receiver. 
And now he was drafted just fine. Obviously, he's got more measurables, but at the pro level, he's catching passes in the preseason. So I'm not, I'm not overly worried about the draft stock thing. But I just think that Ethan Kellick Manis is also going to have more confidence in throwing those dump offs. Like he he's going to feel like he's just going to just let it go, and maybe we'll get four yards on second and ten through the air. What do you think, Aaron? I, I think all the over arguments are good ones, uh, but I still have nightmares of the pass play to Manungai in the Ohio State game uh, up the middle of the field that was extremely awkward and led to a pick six. And I think, uh, like Richie, I, I think they, they, they don't want to risk injury with him. Uh, and I think, you know, his, he's best suited in the run game, although you made all great points. I think uh, he's going to be in that under in terms of receptions because that's where he's most comfortable and I think that's where the offense, that's their bread and butter. And I think you don't risk that in terms of uh, trying to uh, incorporate something that hasn't really been there in the past. Yeah, and, and I was echoing Aaron a little bit. You guys are making some really convincing arguments for the over. And I think 14.5 is like right where it should be to make it a tough call. I think it was a little bit higher. I think it'd be tough, but I have the under. Um, kind of echoing what Richie said. You know, he he hasn't, he had six last year. I also think he's going to come out on some obvious passing downs. And I also think that he kind of stayed into block on some passing downs, especially if the O-line might be shaky. And he's laid some back-breaking blocks and has been trusted to be in there on, on passing downs to watch the quarterback. And you're going to maybe need to rely on that skill set as well, which also translates to the NFL, I think. Um, and I think, look, we, we have guys on the outside, and it looks like Shiraka likes to throw screens and throw short passes designed to guys on the outside. So I don't know how much we're going to see in the play design, really Kyle out there uh, catching those short passes, or how much we're going to see him out in dump-off lanes, given his blocking ability and how he's going to be used per snap. So I got the under. The final Menungai stat we have here is total touchdowns on the season. I have it set at 10.5. I kind of alluded to him getting some gaudy numbers. I think if he does have some gaudy numbers this year, it's primarily in the touchdown department. I have him over on this number. He had seven in the regular season last year. I think when you include his my projected usage in, in the passing game and the fact that Gavin Wimsat isn't just getting, you know, the you know the Jalen Hurts tush push calls anymore. You know, he scored 11 touchdowns last year, and I think six of them were from the one or two yard line. Uh, right. Kyle Manungai only, yeah, Kyle Manungai had, I think, only one touchdown within the five last year. So I think he is going to get the line share of those carries this year rather than them plowing Ethan Kaliak Manis into the line. So I'm going to go over on the 10 and a half. I could see him almost, I could see him doubling his number from last year, which was seven uh, on this season. It's How about me. you, David? Yep. I mean, I just, the compelling argument is that if he has like three or four in one game, then like Larry was saying, then this, this is easy, but I just, I just think that teams are going to stack that box and there's not a need to have him taking a one yard dive three times in a row just to prove that you can do it. So I, I I'm going to take the under, I just think there's going to be just easy pickings on some of those play action at the goal line where a tight end just hits a defensive end and it leaks out. And he's going to be wide open. And I just feel like, why not take that? That's just going to be as sure of a thing as the Manung guy. So I'm going to take the under, but I, I mean, it's not really possible he gets 20 and I look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> How about yeah. you, Aaron? I'm going over. I think uh, it was an excellent point about Wimsett not being there anymore with all the one and two yarder he took. Uh, so I think I think Manung guy goes over uh, also in terms of touchdowns. Uh, you said, what, f 14 or 15? I don't know. Or it's 10 and a half. Yeah, I think he gets at least 12. And I, I have a confession to make. I, I don't know when your answers were due. There was no deadline. I filled this thing out, like Mike said, a day before. And I actually just changed <laughs> my answer. And in court, sometimes we, we have this thing where we wonder, did the judge already make up his mind or is he actually listening to the oral mm -hmm. argument? And quite frankly, mm -hmm. Mike, you just made me change my answer and make it over. And the reason is you just make a great point with in terms of what his numbers were last year and all those carries and touchdowns that were taken away uh, with Gavin Wimsett running it in. Uh, also, flashbacks of that Ohio State game with that awkward pass. I was screaming from the the side, you know, from the stands, just run the ball, run the ball. And if, had we run it, even a lot of Ohio State guys will tell you we would have won that game. So, you know, I just don't see a lot of people taking carries from him. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The guy's going to get a couple hard yards almost any time you hand him the rock. 
If we're down near the red zone, why wouldn't they feed him the rock? I think if they do that more often than they did last year, because there's no uh, touches that have to go to the quarterback, uh, I think he he gets over just barely, but I think he does. President of the uh, Gavin Wimsett Hater Club here. How's it going? Um, <laughs> the man had a 11 touchdowns last year at quarterback. How many tush pushes did we see where they're at the one yard line and it took them three or four tries to get in? The pinstripe in the Miami game it. alone. Yeah, yeah, that was like brutal. It's it's insane. This man was just stealing touchdown after touchdown from Kyle Wanungai. And last year he was able to get eight. So if he doesn't have at least 11, I'd be shocked. I think I'm going to take the over and I think he'll get at least 11, if not more. Yeah, and I think I might have misspoke before. I said he had one carry from within the five. I think he had one touchdown from within the five. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, Thievery. Yeah. So let's for the let's record, talk- though, for the record, I believe only 11 guys have ever rushed for double digit rushing touchdowns in a season in Rutgers history. Wow. So there's really not as many as you would think. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, that is kind of shocking. You, you would have thought just from like the old school way of playing football where it's just three yards in a cloud of dust that somebody would have had, you know, uh, even, we've been playing as long as we have. That's crazy. Um, yeah, don't let people see that. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but one of those guys is your boy, Richie. 11 oh. touchdowns last year. Oh, stop, stop. No, relax. <laughs> See, we're, not, we're not doing this. See, this, is why not. That's, why, that's why I'm I'm putting the mic on you every 10 seconds. I gotta, I gotta stop myself. I've so noticed. I gotta that. think about what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Richie, where's your Kentucky hat? Oh, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> what, 2B3? 2B4? Running back two? Like, yeah. Oh, I'm man. I am a bad, I'm a hater. I'm a professional hater. Well, speaking of the quarterback position, let's combine Ethan Kaliak Manis's uh, predictions here. So I have his passing yards at 2,499, and I have his passing touchdowns at 17 and a half. So, David, I'm going to hand it off to you. Where do you think he sits on both these stats, both the yardage and the, t- the passing touchdowns, over or under? I'm going to go quick. I'm going to go under on yards. I think he'll throw for about 2,200 because, I mean, that's really where the Leviano line is and the Mike <laughs> McMahon line. <laughs> and on the touchdowns, I'm going to take the under because even though I said Manunga would be under, I think overall, like, the rushing attack is going to have a lot. So I'm going to take the under on touchdowns, but obviously I, I, I hope it's over because that's probably a good thing. Yep. Yeah, I uh, when I had Larry on the Scarlet Faithful, we talked about this actually. And and uh, other than Laviano, you had that one uh, you know weird year with COVID with Vedral, averaged over 150 yards passing. Uh, but I definitely think uh, Calix Manis will average over that. But even if he do- averages over that, that's only 18, 1900 yards. I think he'll be in that 22 to 2300 range, uh, and I think he'll be under TDs as well. Uh, in terms of overall, just simply because the Manungai factor, like we just talked about. Uh, but one thing we don't have on there that I think I, I'm hopeful he can do is have over a 60% accuracy completion rate. Uh, that's one thing I am optimistic on. But in terms of these numbers, it's not a negative, but I think that I, I'm going under on both 2,500 passing yards and 17 and a half TDs. And if he could just get to 60, I'd be content with that. By the way, I wonder if Minnesota fans do what Rutgers fans do and follow their former quarterbacks. Like, we just had the Evan Simon thread today, too. It's like whether they were second (laughs) string and they want to say they should have started. And then people are always bringing up what other quarterbacks are doing elsewhere to prove their point from when they were at Rutgers. It's hilarious. It's a journey. Free Reddick. Um, But I'm going to (laughs) go. That was a fun time in history. When I was on the board, I was like public enemy. Go back into the archives. It's hilarious. Um. I'm going to go under on the yardage. Uh, Ethan hasn't, you know, been as prolific in his first two seasons throwing the ball yardage-wise. His first season, obviously, better than his second season. Rooting for him to get there, I think he'll be close to it, like Aaron said. Um, It's not out of the question. I just, you know, I I don't know if I could see it, especially if he's going to dink and dunk down the the field a little more. We're going to have a lot more running. I Oddly, and and perhaps, you know, a little bit – you know, in a parad- paradoxically, I have them over on the touchdowns. And the reason is, I think, A, if you stack up in those two games again, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how long he's going to play. It could really rack up some stats there. Um, also, I, I liked, you know, I went with Miller as far as touchdown leader for big plays. But, you know, you guys brought up a lot of good points about strong in the red zone. And if we're down in the red zone and we do have that play action or they are stacking the box, you could get a lot of real short yardage, kind of easy pitch and catch touchdowns down low. And I think with the way our offense, I believe, is going to be improved and churning a little bit with all the playmakers, 
Uh, it, it's bullish. It's a little bit crazy, but I, I think he could do the over, and I'm going to put my money there. I'm going to say under on probably both yardage and touchdowns. I think Dave was kind of spot on with the like 2200 mark. Um, last time Rutgers had a quarterback that threw for 2200 was Tom Savage, and I think he'll have kind of eerily similar stats to him in his uh, freshman year now. Obviously, Ethan's not a freshman, but 14 touchdowns, seven interceptions, 2,200 yards for Savage in 09. I think that's pretty similar to what he'll put up this year. Um, I hope the percentage is higher than the 52% he threw, but uh, I know Aaron said around 60, which I'm kind of optimistic of Ethan being able to hit that mark. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to go under on both. So I'm going to go over on both, and I'll kind of get into why. Uh, so in order to go over the – the number he got an average 210 yards a season over a 12 game span i don't think he'll like i said earlier with about consistency i don't think he'll consistently go over 200 yards mm-hmm. but i think the way that the the offense is constructed this year i don't think we're going to have to play one-handed all season i think if teams are keen on stopping the run we'll be able to pass like like david was saying if they're just going to load the box in situations and let guys kind of leak out and get open I think we're going to be able to take advantage of it this year in a way we couldn't last year. So I have a feeling, and we'll get into this more in the scheduling, I have a feeling we're going to get into at least one or two shootouts this year where we have to kind of score and keep up, and the defense just isn't going to be able to you know, play keep away for us all game. So in those situations where we do kind of have to you know, get into an offensive game, I think we have the ability to do that. I don't think the team is necessarily going to want to do that or be comfortable doing it every game, but I think – you know, we have we had some games under flood, like the, the Fresno State comes to mind, where it was like 52 to 49. I don't think that game is going to happen this year, but I could easily see there being like a 37 to 34 game where we win on a late field goal. And, you know, Ethan has 290 yards and four touchdowns or something like that. And then the next game he passed for 150 and one touchdown because it's, you know, a game that we kind of win going away. So that's the only reason I think it happens is because I think there's a couple games this year that are unexpected kind of shootouts. Um So I have it over on both the yardage and the the touchdowns. Um, Let's talk about breakout player now. Breakout player can mean whatever you guys want it to mean in your own minds, whether it be a guy who went from nothing and is then by midseason, you know, a contributor. If he's a guy who ends up leading the team and receiving or rushing that was unexpected, I'm not going to put too many bounds on it. So it's just the breakout player of the season on offense and I forget where we are in the order, if somebody remembers. I think Aaron's um, going first. I think I got to go first on the last one. All right, Aaron, who is your breakout player on offense this year? I'm just going to be consistent with what I've said. Uh, I'm going to go with Ian Strong. I'm all in on him in terms of if you can lead this team in uh, res- t- touchdown receptions and uh, be that big threat in the red zone, I think he is that breakout player and gives the offense the dynamic they haven't had. So I'm going Ian Strong. I'm going, uh, and I heard this name mentioned twice by Richie, so I know he's thought about him a little bit, but Nassim Brantley. And and my kind of uh, perspective on this question was, you know, a guy who's not being as discussed quite as much, but then all of a sudden becomes like a prominent piece on the team that, you know, week in and week out, there's some clutch catch or some decent play in there that that helps to, to elevate the team and get us across the finish line. I think he's somebody who... Last year would have been maybe one of our, our primary wideout playmakers, might have been a starter and didn't get to play. And now this year, he I, I think he serves a, a prominent role based on some of Shiano's comments. I think he does kind of I, I think if you remember the basketball a couple of years ago, Yaboa when he came in and he would always hit that clutch three or would always be there. I don't think he's necessarily that upperclassman presence, although he is. I think he's that guy that like, wow, we needed to play in Brantley, Brantley. You're going to hear his name more than you would have thought. And for that reason, he's my breakout player. Uh, I'm going to have to stick with Chris Long. I've been talking about him quite a bit this show. Uh, I think he was probably wide receiver one last year before the season, before the uh, season opener injury that lost him for the the entire year. And I think he has a chance to be up there again. Now, I don't know if he'll be wide receiver one because I think Daimir Miller's that that game changer at receiver. And you can argue he's technically a breakout, but – um, I think Chris Long's gonna have a pretty solid year, and he's gonna show some people uh, that he is fully healthy, and he might he might uh, impress more than you think. I'm gonna go with the tried and true answer here. I'm gonna go with Ian Strong because I think, given all the attention he's getting from the social media uh, team at Rutgers, you know, he did that like promo where he's camping at the uh, the practice grounds. You know, he's been featured on several posts on the Instagram and Twitter feeds for for Rutgers football. I think he's going to play a huge part in this offense. And I think he 
could very well lead the team in a lot of offensive uh, numbers receiving wise. So I'm going to go with Ian Strong. How about you, David? All good answers. I think it's going to be a freshman or a redshirt freshman, either running back or receiver, because I think all of us know the names. Well, maybe not a casual fan would know all the names that you guys said, but I just think that one of the things that made that, for example, 2006 season so special was halfway through the year. Now you're seeing Kenny Britt doing something special and then go a little further. And then it's Tim Brown. And then I think that somebody is going to build that momentum that is Ben Black, KJ Duff, one of the running backs, somebody else. So I guess I'll go with Duff, but this is because I have no insider information and I haven't heard them say anything about him, just like we've seen in the past. So it's entirely possible that it's him or one of the other freshmen. But I, I think even like a Fama Toure, like played better than – we realized because of the quarterback play last year. So I think there's opportunity for those younger guys and they're only going to get as much as they can handle early on. And then they're just going to continue to build on it. Yeah, I can totally see that. Um, I have offensive MVP as the next category. I want somebody, if, if somebody doesn't have Kyle Manungai, please raise your hand and state your case. Aaron, let's hear your case for somebody other than Kyle Manungai. So if, the offense takes the step that we all seem to think it will. Uh, and the pass game is much improved. I think you can make the argument that the MVP could be Ethan Kalik Manis simply because uh, Rutgers was so deficient in the pass game last year. If they can just be average, what they would do, what that would do for the offense overall. Obviously, Manungai, you know, is the most important player. Uh, and, you know, by statistical measure will be the MVP. But in terms of the dynamic that they're sorely have missed for so many years, if Kalik Manis can just be uh, competent, I think you have to look at him as the MVP simply for what it will do for everybody else and the overall impact of the offense. Definitely can see that. Um, the last category I have, so everybody else just for clarity's sake has comment on guy as the yes. MVP. Yeah, okay. Um, the last category on offense we have here is the total offensive rank. I have the over-under set at 69, nice and a half. Um, last year, Rutgers ranked 120th in total offense with 306 yards a game. Uh, the 69th ranked offense last year was Wisconsin at 381 yards per game. I'm going to say under, and that means better, just to set the tone for everyone else, because I know over under on a team stat like this is kind of weird. So I'm going to say they finished better than 69th in total offense this year. David, what do you think? I'd say worse. I would say because if you're saying that Wisconsin is that line of demarcation, they had five really good receivers. They had a couple of good running backs. I just, I just see a lot of games that are tough that Rutgers isn't going to be putting up 500, 600 yards like a team in, you know, a lower division or the mat, it's a maction for you on like a Tuesday night that might, you know, those teams might have a better offense, even though they're not a better team. So I, I don't think Rutgers will be better than 69th or 70. I think they'll be in the 70 ish, low 80s, maybe. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, I agree. I, I'm going to go somewhere in the 70s. So just missing that over or under. Uh, but I think the point is that would still be a tremendous improvement from what they were last year. And I think that is the overall picture because I think it then goes back to Shiraka and Shiano and how they want to win games. I agree with you. There might be a shootout here or there, an unexpected one, unexpected one. But if you look at November, those are all very winnable games. And I think that Rutgers, that's really where you'll see the identity of this team and uh, the way they like to win is I, I think how they will or can win those games. So I think uh, I, I think they'll miss that. I think they'll be much improved, but I think in terms of the grand scheme of things, they'll finish somewhere in that uh, seventy to seventy-eight range. Say that. I could see them in the sixties. I mean, I, I'm with you, Mike. I looked at the the rankings last year and kind of tried to place them. I looked where we were and thought about the improvement. You know, nod to Richie just just in the quarterback position. You know, and I was a little more friendly to Gavin, but I mean, at the end of the day, man, it, it if it's not substantially head and shoulders approve, you know, improve, then we're in trouble. And if it is substantially improved, even if it's not setting the world on fire, it's going to elevate us just, I mean, probably 20 spots just on that, I would think. We have a lot of these, these players this year who, you know, all on the outside and in the backfield that can rack things up. Uh, the, you, the left side of the line, you got guys you're confident in coming back. Um, 
And I just, you know, looking at the defenses we're going up against, it's not like there's all, you know, just easy to run through defenses. But, you know, you don't have Iowa on the schedule. You don't have that big three on the schedule. And so I think, you know, with our tried and battle-tested team here who has had to fight through that, we, we you know, it might just be that you're finding a little less resistance with a better quarterback, with more playmakers, with more experience. And I, I think we can get into the – you know, low to mid sixties, which is why I, I'm doing the under better. Kind of wanted to run through a brick wall after that one. Not gonna lie, <laughs> <laughs> I got a got a little hyped. I was feeling it for a sec, but anyway, uh, I'm I'm gonna go over. I, I think uh, what Aaron and Dave said before, um, it's gonna it's not like a Pac-12 or recently deceased Pac-12 offense. Um, it's not like a Big 12 offense. It's not matching. It's ground and pound football. It's just gonna if Greg can go up three, nothing and need the ball for the rest of the game and still win three, nothing, I think he'd do it. He's just, it's not a super powerful offensive mindset of this team. It's all going to be defense and just run, 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 run out the clock. We're up, we're up 10. That's it. Game over. They're not going to blow anyone out. Now they might blow out Howard. Cause that's, you, that's just by default. It's almost like they don't blow out Howard. We're going to be on an emergency pod, uh, yeah. you know, talking about the sky's burning, yeah. all the money that I've spent uh, betting on this team in the off season exactly. is going to go out the window. Yeah. yeah. Between that, between Akron, I think that's whatever, but I think for the most part, you're just going to win by like maybe 10 to 14. You might get a lucky game where you win by 21, but I'd, I'd be a little shocked. I think it's going to be a very, um, not low outputting offense. It's just not going to be a superstar offense that probably most people would love to see, but it's just not realistic in the big 10 or under Greg Shiano. So that has been our offensive preview. Does anyone have any closing thoughts on the offense that we might not have touched on or maybe some kind of anecdote? Aaron? Yeah, yeah that this just made me think that we're gonna have you're gonna have a thread on rivals uh for mm -hmm. that those fans that are still clamoring for Phil Longo to be the offense. <laughs> you brought up Wisconsin, and you know there's still some diehard fans that are waiting for it to happen because he is from New Jersey. So just mm -hmm. wanted to throw that out there. I look forward to reading that thread. I'll I had one, Mike, which is when we talk about the backup quarterback, especially being a reason to be worried uh, or a reason for long term optimism. I mean, I think you have to it's rare that you have a situation where, you know, the Jets last year, your quarterback goes down four plays in the season, misses the whole year. Usually you're just relying on your backup quarterback to come and get you through a game, two weeks, three weeks type of thing. And I feel pretty confident in the offensive staff in their ability to maybe that first game, they just go full blown, like run, run, run quarterback power if they have to. But I do think that the Soraka offense is versatile enough that they would be able to get through a few weeks. Now the problem would be, and when we get to the schedule episode, when are those weeks, if you had to do that. But I do think that I have confidence in the offensive staff that if they had to, they, they could make those adjustments. And I'm one I'll say and, and kind of kind of to piggyback off what Dave said, you know, we live it a lot of this is going to come down to the quarterback. How improved is quarterback play? Because so much of what was the difference between, you know, really a, a legendary or, or or much, you know, more unexpected season last year and and the six and six season was that, you know, 10 percentage points in, in accuracy from the quarterback, the consistency from the quarterback, and then what Dave said, the possible injuries to the quarterback and when that could occur. Further, I think, you know, you heard Shiano a little bit, I, I think, recently said there are guys who are dinged up and he's not going to go into them because they're not season ending. But I'm wondering, you know, with these injuries to the offensive side of the ball, who could it be? Is it a little couple week thing? We have two easy games, so they say, and then a bye week. So you have almost a month. Or is it like a half season, two thirds season lingering? A lot of this depends on quarterback play and staying healthy, and it's going to be interesting to see as the season progresses. They, they won seven games with Gavin Wimsett. I don't care who the backup is. The guy just has to walk in. Hey, here you go, Kyle. Do whatever you got to do, and I'm done. Fair enough. It, Fair enough. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that makes David's point stronger than uh, <laughs> the, the offense we were able to build last year, basically out of just common on guy and you know a, a much improved. Uh, offensive line uh, to, with the tutelage of uh, Coach Flats. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's been our offensive preview. Uh, if you're listening to this at the time of, it rele of the release on Tuesday morning, we'll have the defensive preview for you later this afternoon. Um, if you're listening and you might just have everything in your queue, lucky you. Um, so we're going to turn this over to the defensive preview. Thanks again for everybody for listening, and we'll see you on the other side.